So I wanted to, um, as the beginning of a New Year's talk, share a kind of a story that has been drifting around in I think many traditions. And it's about a diamond thief. He's also a really well-known pickpocket. And he hangs around the diamond district in, in India. And um, he's just to see who's purchasing what. And one day, uh, a very well-known diamond merchant purchased one of the most beautiful, valuable gems around. And this guy followed him. And he boarded a train. And for the next three days during this journey on the train, um, he tried to pick the merchant's pocket and get that jewel. And at the end of the journey, he hadn't found it. And he was completely frustrated. So he, he was an accomplished thief. And it, kind of his pride was wounded. <laughs> so he finally confronted the uh, merchant. And he confessed and, and, and basically said, I've used all the skills of my art. Where did you hide it? Like, how did that happen? And the merchant responded, well, I saw you. I suspected what was going on. So I hid the, I hid the diamond in the place you'd be least likely to expect, in your own pocket, you know. <laughs> and I share that because the, the understanding is really that the treasure we seek, what we really long for, is closer than we can possibly imagine that the treasure we seek, the freedom, the happiness, the love, is already and always right here. It's right inside us. And yet we move through our life as if in this, in this trance that it's somewhere else. So we not only look in the wrong place, but we forget really what we're looking for. That's kind of an, an opening to what we'll be exploring. Thoreau says that we spend our life fishing only to find out it wasn't fish that we were after. And so there's this deep, this deep recognition, really, that the spiritual path is simply a process of forgetting, forgetting and then remembering, and then forgetting again, and then remembering. And we go back and forth. We, we kind of begin to get that. And one of the very enlivening things about beginning a new year is there's a kind of collective sense of stepping back and looking. It just happens. We do that with these little time segments in our life. And it can be a very valuable moment if we um, bring our hearts to it in that stepping back and looking to actually re-engage in our life in a more wholehearted, intentional way. So that's the, that's the possibility. So different spiritual traditions have uh, different practices and rituals and ceremonies that help with remembering. And what we'll be exploring tonight is a ceremony called Taking Refuge. And it's very well described in the Buddhist tradition, but the process is it's based on three gateways that help us realize that diamond, that, that radiance, that clarity, that purity, which is our deepest nature. And the three gateways you'll find in many, many spiritual traditions. And the first gateway that is described is called taking refuge in Buddha or Buddha nature. Buddha means awakened nature. So the first refuge is learning to see and perceive and inhabit that purity of awareness itself. The second refuge is called taking refuge in the Dharma in the Buddhist tradition. And that really means taking refuge in the truth of the moment. Right here what's happening. And the third refuge which is taking refuge in the Sangha. Sangha means the community of spiritual friends. It really means taking refuge in loving presence. So we'll be exploring each of these domains and then ending the evening with a uh, 
what I think of as a real a living ritual. It's very, it's, we will bring ourselves into it fully. And it's quite beautiful. I love it. And I'm curious how many of you have done this with us before, the uh, refuge ceremony? Yeah, a good number. Yeah. That's another form of wake up. <laughs> God is calling. <laughs> so another uh, language for the three refuges that we explore is the triple gem, which is really different uh, facets of that diamond that is within us. And uh, my book, True Refuge, is organized around these three archetypal gateways. And the basic teaching is that our suffering is because we live in a trance or a story of a limited self that's separate from the rest of the world. And that as we turn towards each of these ways of paying attention to truth, to love, you know, to our belonging, to awareness, uh, we awaken out of that narrow belonging. We awaken to, re- to that diamond is free to really shine. We get to inhabit the fullness of who we are. So we'll be um, beginning actually in a way that I find most useful by looking at how we forget, how we forget the diamond, how we forget that what we cherish and what's true is really our own deepest essence. And I often call this process one of we we get hooked on false refuges that instead of turning to love or turning to awareness or turning to the present moment, we get hooked on substitutes, okay? And one of the ways that I've heard it described is that we, we put the ladder on the wall and we climb up only to find we've been climbing up the ladder on the wrong wall. You know, we took all, we took all this energy and not only are we climbing up the ladder, we race up the ladder and we're racing away from something. So it's all based on this innocent misunderstanding of what will bring us happiness. A huge amount of activity of our day and a huge amount of our mind states comes from this misunderstanding of what will really free us. And in both Buddhist and Western psychology, um, that misunderstanding is described in this way that we have this reflex when there's pleasantness to think to be happy, I need to hold on. Or I need to run after it and get it. And we have a reflex when there's something unpleasant to think, well, to be happy or peaceful, I need to get away from it. That basic dynamic of trying to control our experience actually obscures the diamond because it takes us from presence. Most of our moments, if we check it out, if we become aware of our own process, we're moving away from something or moving towards something. There's rarely an inner kind of stillness that has that equanimity that's just open to what's coming and going. And yet, it's only when there's that unmoving quality of presence that we can sense the the shine of what we are and the tenderness and how that same shine and tenderness is in each being that we are in relationship with. So, there's this misunderstanding. And we have this if-only mind, that's what it's usually called in um, Buddhist circles, that we have this if-only mind that, ha- that has a sense that if only such and such I'll feel better. And it's usually if only I get this done or get past this event that's really demanding or scary or if only somebody that we love that's acting a certain way will just cooperate with the way we think they should be then I'll be happy. Or if only my body is, you know, 20 pounds less or has this kind of appearance, less wrinkles or whatever it is. So there's this if only, and then we're always moving towards what we think is going to make the difference. We're on our way somewhere. 
So the challenge is really to step back and look at our patterns and reflect, is this, is what I go towards each day or what I run from, is that process bringing me happiness? Like a real honest, does that bring happiness? Is this serving freedom? I'll share that one of my, uh, one of my insights into false refuge many years ago, I realized that when people said to me, oh, Tara, you're so busy, um, I felt internally some pride about it. Like there was something, you know, good about being busy. And I, the more I investigated it, it's just there, there was this sense that um, what I was going for was a certain appearance of busy and accomplishing so that I would get respect, so I would feel worthy, so I would feel like I was a good person. So I had this whole worthiness project going on. And um, it was very fleeting, you know, whether... And it wasn't just the busyness when somebody would admire something. There was this, like, inflation. But what I started finding out was that in the moments that I was feeling really happy, or really peaceful, or really freed up, it had nothing to do with any accomplishment, with any kind of admiration, any appreciation, any approval, nothing to do with any of it. Not only that, in the moments when I was going for any of that, and by the way, I'm not saying that activity and creativity and accomplishment can't be, an, can't be a, a, re, a part of our flourishing, but in the moments I was kind of grasping onto it, I was not in presence, not, it wasn't available to me the diamond was obscured, that uh, awakeness, that tenderness was obscured. So the challenges were hooked on substitutes. I mean, if we're not free, it's because in some way there's, we're hooked and we haven't examined it. And for many of us it's approval. We're hooked on what the culture basically says is good you know, be intelligent or make a lot of money or look a certain way or, you know, appear a certain way. Uh, I was really struck. We just came back, a number of us, in fact, I've I've been seeing the faces here from our uh, annual New Year's retreat. And I was very struck by one woman in her 60s who was... uh, she you know, said, described herself as she's, you know, the type A that was always striving and never felt like she was enough. During the retreat, her mind kind of got quiet and she touched an experience that felt precious and rare of absolutely feeling like enough. Like, uh, there was just, as I am, it's fine. And there was a real deep peace with that and she kind of sadly said, why did I have to wait so long to realize I don't have to always try to prove myself? Even more of that, that in the moments of trying to prove myself, I'm clearly feeling underneath that not enough. It kind of reaffirms not enough. So we go fishing. And it's just interesting to notice what we're fishing for and whether the moments we catch, we wouldn't be hooked unless we got a temporary lift from it. We have, to, we have to get some benefits. You know, I talk to people that are constantly overanalyzing what's going on and at retreat one, one woman was describing how she's always figuring out everything and analyzing and judging and comparing, but she's gotten, she's very bright. She's gotten so many benefits, so many kudos from this bright mind that it's hard to remember that that intellect, figuring things out, will not reveal the real, true essence of who she is. You can't think your way into freedom. It's a tool, but it's not going to carry us. So we go fishing and we do it, you know, for sensory pleasures and many moments of the day just notice, you know, what what are we trying to get? One story of a woman in Miami, she's sitting on a bench and this guy comes and sits next to her, it's in a park or something and, and she says, so, what's your story? And 
He says, well, actually I just got out in prison 25 years. She goes, oh, what were you in prison for? And he says, well, I murdered my wife. And she goes, so, you're single, <laughs> you know? <laughs> You know, they say it in India that what, when, a, when a pickpocket sees a saint, they see the saint's pocket. It's like, you know, what are we, what are we fishing for and what are we missing out on? <laughs> Zen Master Ryokan, he says, if you want to find the meaning, stop chasing after so many things. Okay, so this is one way that we are out there, you know, trying to steal the diamond, get the diamond, and just not remembering. We're chasing after things. The other way we kind of leave and obscure who we are is in the moments that we're resisting what's unpleasant, and we all know about that. I mean, it's like when there's pain, we want it to go away. And that's part of our, our conditioning, but it's so pervasive that we get locked into our strategies and what are they? We run away from unpleasantness or discomfort by going online. I name that a lot these days because I'm so aware of it as an addiction. And we do it in many numbing activities, whether it's using drugs or alcohol or shopping or whatever it is, but we do it that way. And we do it through our anger and our aggression and our judgment. We try to get rid of unpleasantness by controlling it with our judgment. You know the line that the world is divided into those who think they're right. And that's the whole line. <laughs> it's, it's everything. So our, probably our biggest way of trying to uh, get what we want and avoid what we don't want, our kind of substitutes, is through obsessive thinking. We're addicted to thinking, to figuring things out. And in the moments of obsessive thinking, those moments we can't open to and recognize and inhabit uh, what's here. They take us away. So it becomes a really valuable and important inquiry to find for ourselves, well, how am I trying to seek satisfaction or relief or peace? Like, what am, what, what's my strategy? And is it working? And it's a beautiful way to begin a new year because we have the opportunity to look with some honesty and some clarity. And we can decide in any moment, hey, there's a way of deepening attention and coming home that's possible. So this was the question the Buddha asked. You know, he looked at his life and he said, you know, okay, there's aging, there's sickness, there's death, everything's insecure, I'm going to lose everything. Is what I'm doing and the way I'm living, I'm serving happiness and freedom. And this is the way he described it. He said, why should I, who am subject to birth, old age and sickness, death, sorrow and suffering, why should I take refuge in that which is also subject to change? Let me find that which is changeless, which is deathless, which is unborn and undying, that is a true refuge. And that's what he did. I mean, this is why so many people are following the teachings and practices of the Buddha and this is not just the Buddha this is really the inquiry of every saint and sage and mystic through history and this is our inquiry we get it these lives are insecure we get it that everything that is conditioned to exist is also conditioned to non-existence And that really, if we want to feel peaceful, we have to find a refuge that is timeless. Sometimes that refuge is described as loving awareness, as God, as spirit. 
It's a quality of wholeness of being or beingness. Many, many names. But regardless of the name, as the Buddha described it, this whole world is changing. What is changeless? What's always and already here? And again, this is, uh, I love the diamond metaphor because you can sense the, a kind of luminosity and purity that is really at the source of all being. So how to realize that, how to come home to that is really the inquiry. So we begin to explore these three gateways of turning from that which is kind of chasing after or resisting to a quality of timeless presence. And we begin with the first gateway that I described. Um, actually, I'm going to do them in a different order. In the traditional Buddhist um, teachings, it's the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. I'm going to start with Dharma because Dharma has to do with the practices that we all do together and I think it's a very good ground for this. Now, in each of the three gateways, there's an outer expression and an inner expression. And the outer expression of Dharma, I'm going to be asking you to reflect for yourself on what most resonates for you because it really covers the whole path. The outer expression of Dharma is all, any teaching, any practice that really serves your awakening and freedom. So for you, it may be coming to classes, it may be retreats, it might be books, it might be listening to audio talks, it might be certain reflections. Um, for you, taking refuge in the Dharma, which is the path of freedom, could be anything that helps you to feel a sense of spiritual strength, a sense of inspiration, a sense of really understanding more clearly the nature of reality. That's the outer. The inner refuge of Dharma is the practice of paying attention to what is right here now. It's the truth of the moment. So the inner practice is really learning to pause because we're all rolling forward into what next can I have to make me more comfortable or how do I get away from this? We're leaving the moment. The taking refuge in the Dharma, sometimes called the truth, means taking refuge by pausing and sensing, oh, what's right here? It's that question, what is happening inside me right now. And then it's that inquiry, and can I be with this? That is taking refuge in truth. The challenge is learning to stay. We dip in a little bit and we sprint off. This is Charlotte Joko Beck, a Zen teacher. She says, return to that which we have spent a lifetime hiding from. Learn to return to that which you have spent a lifetime hiding from, to rest in the bodily experience of the present moment. Even if it is a feeling of being humiliated, of failing, of abandonment, of unfairness, learn to come back to what we've been running from. So how come? Why would we want to have to come back and hang out with unpleasantness? And what we start discovering is that, first of all, there's some wisdom in us that knows that if we're running away, we'll never be at peace. Because we'll always sense that there's something there that's lurking, you know, under the covers or something around the corner that's going to get me. So only by facing the reality of what's here and befriending it and making peace with it, can we find a sense of real refuge? So something wise in us already knows that. And what happens is, as we learn to stay, as we bring presence to what's here, we discover in that presence a sense of space, a sense of tenderness, and a sense of clarity. In other words, we find our refuge just by staying give you an example, um, very, very recent for me, of, uh, again, a, 
a way a false refuge. I um, had my family, um, my sisters and my son and his partner, come in about a week before Christmas to stay with me, and that meant I had a mob, real mob for me, <laughs> of people staying at my house a week, and I was still like, to me, well, I'm still, I'm still working, but they were there, and so I had to figure out a way to keep communicating that, that um, I'm not ready to take off and party, you know. Was, so, so there I was, and, and I had a, a very, very busy lead up to the holidays. I had to um, put together a lot of talks and deal with a lot of things to do with uh, this book launching and so on. So I, I was kind of over my head. So when I was with them, I found that I was constantly feeling either guilty or apologetic, but trying to angle so I could get out of a conversation and go back to my desk. Like every encounter on some level, I had in the back of my mind, how do I really cut this one short, <laughs> you know? And, um, and I was really kind of mechanical. And then it hit me that, hey, wait a minute, you know, um, I'm, I'm hooked on my have to get things done, I'm on my way somewhere else mode, and these are very, very dear beings, and who knows how long we have. So I said, okay, I'm going to learn to stay. So I'd be with say my son and he'd be telling me something he's really excited about and I would just you know I just feel in my body I just say okay what's going on and I'd feel the anxiety because it's just kind of a clutching and um, just kind of inwardly name it okay anxious want to get things done name it a few times breathe with it and I found that if I just stayed and stayed really honest with my own discomfort gradually there was this kind of presence that would open up that there was actually room for him. And I could listen, and I could be there. And it was true with my sister who was visiting, and we'd take walks, and, I, and rather than shortcutting the walks, I'd take, we'd take more time, and it, the space would open up again. It's so easy for anxiety about getting things done to override what most matters. It's like we spend our life on our way somewhere else. At least that was what I was realizing. So during the retreat, we were doing a gratitude reflection, and I was overwhelmed, I mean, really tearing up with sensing, wow, that precious moment with that person, and that moment with that person, and if we, you know, all died tomorrow, it was like, this is what mattered, that there was that genuineness of presence and, and contact. We'll ta let's take a few moments to reflect together. I'd like to invite you to sense for yourself this refuge in Dharma. I mean, that story is just a, a brief example for me of choosing to turn towards the present moment and in turning towards the present moment, coming back to that kind of diamond quality. So you might begin by just pause, letting this be a pause, closing your eyes and sensing what helps you to arrive right here. Maybe you're aware of the ways you leave the present moment in your life or in a meditation. what the fears are, what, the, what you're running towards or what you're running away from. But you might want to ask that to yourself. Even in this moment, what might I be running away from? What might I be hiding from? What might be asking my attention? It might be something, it might be unpleasant, or it may be something like there's a longing there that you, that's asking for your attention, a longing for more contact, more intimacy, more space, more creative time. Or maybe it is some anxiety or feeling of powerlessness.
for many, we run from a kind of loneliness, a feeling of separateness. And for others, it's really running from a deep sense of doubt, uh, um, this fear, fear of I'm really not okay, I'm not an okay person. What are we running from? To take refuge in the Dharma, in the truth of the moment, we pause and notice what's here and, and I'd invite you to let go of all thoughts and just see if you can bring your attention fully to the experience of your body, of your heart. Taking refuge has it's got the word faith in it. The in Pali means resting your heart in what is true. See if you can rest your heart in your experience. It's a kind of faithing, as if faith is a verb, a surrendering. So that whatever's going on inside you, you just Bring your attention, your heart, a tenderness to it. It takes courage to take refuge in the Dharma and the truth. Courage is a greatness of heart. And yet this presence creates a space for that light, that shining of the diamond, that awake heart. This is a poem called Trusting Prana, which is energy by Dana Fouts. She says, trust the energy that courses through you. Just trust it. Trust and then take surrender even deeper. Be the energy. Be the energy. Don't push anything away. Follow each sensation back to its source in vastness and pure presence. Emerge so new, so fresh, you don't know who you are. Welcome in the season of monsoons. Be the bridge across the flooded river and the surging torrent underneath. Be unafraid of consummate wonder. Be the energy and blaze a trail across the clear night sky like lightning. Dare to be your own illumination. So this is the inner refuge of Dharma or truth. It's opening to the saliveness, opening and opening.